On behalf of Cambridge Health Tech Institute's Global Web Symposia and our sponsor, Biomodels, LLC, I'd like to welcome you to Modeling Human Cancer, a Multidisciplinary Approach. I'd like to introduce our speakers for today's webinar. Our first speaker is Dr. Maria Mancini. She's the Principal Investigator and Oncology Lead at Biomodels, LLC. Our second speaker today will be Dr. David Weinstein, President and Chief Operating Officer at Numera Incorporated. Maria, I pass the presenter ball to you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you to all the attendees today for our webinar. Today we will be talking about modeling uh, human cancers, and we'll be talking about some of the translational animal models that we have developed uh, over the past few years. And in addition, as uh, Elizabeth said, Dave Weinstein will be speaking briefly about some additional ex vivo analyses that can be paired with the translational models that uh, we'll be discussing today. Today, uh, I will be covering in vivo and in vitro models of cancer. We'll be talking about xenografts. We'll be talking about orthotopic models, both syngeneic and non-syngeneic, and defining what those are, and discussing the pros and cons of using uh, each of these models. In addition, we'll be talking about some in vitro systems that we've recently been developing. And we'll be speaking on modeling efficacy in the context of toxicity. And the toxicity we're referring to here is the toxicity associated with standard of care therapies such as radiation and, and chemotherapy to sort of give you a bigger picture to consider when thinking about the long-term efficacy of, of your compounds. So just a brief introduction to biomodels. Um, we are a preclinical CRO. We are located just outside of Boston, Massachusetts. The company was founded in 1997 out of the Brigham and Women's Hospital. The goal of Biomodels is to help you to design highly translational models of human disease and conditions. And this is for a wide variety of clients, ranging from uh, big pharmaceutical companies to, to small startups. We pride ourselves on transitioning drugs or biologics uh, from concept to patients, and we've been able to accomplish this about 36, for about 36 compounds into patients for multiple indications. Uh, our therapeutic expertise here lies within the space of oncology, uh, inflammation-based diseases, cardiovascular disease, neurobiology and behavior, fibrosis, and, and cancer supportive care models. Let's start by defining a translational model. How do you define a translational model? First, a translational model must replicate the clinical condition. Now, the endpoints should be translatable to those used in clinical trials, and the results from the data from the model should be easily interpretable. The underlying biology should be as similar as possible to humans, and the model should be cost-effective and provide actionable information. So we know that many initial discoveries are made using in vitro assays in a lot of uh, basic science research labs, and so the goal is to really sort of bridge the gap between the bench and the bedside. And in vivo models are useful for this, where you can use animal models to uh, look at safety, uh, tolerability, efficacy, and, and sort of determine dosing. So at this point, I would like to spend some time focusing on breast cancer as an example of uh, taking a multifaceted approach to translational modeling. And I'm going to start by just giving a brief background on breast cancer. It is the second leading cause of cancer death in women. Uh, it's projected that more than 230,000 new cases will be diagnosed this year. And this number of new cases actually has remained steady over the past few years. So while the death rates have been declining, breast cancer will unfortunately result in about 40,000 deaths. Uh, this year alone. So the reduction in mortality rates are a result of the uh, better screening techniques that are available and earlier detection, uh, as well as new therapies. However, one in five patients will still relapse within 10 years of treatment. So there is a lot of work to be done still in this area uh, and to understand why these relapses happen and, and how to prevent them. So I'd like to start talking about modeling with the most basic sort of traditional xenograft model, which really is sort of the workhorse of, of animal models. And in a xenograft model, cells can be implanted subcutaneously uh, in the flank of the animal, a rodent or a, a, I'm sorry, a mouse or a rat. This typically produces a solid sort of encapsulated contained tumor that can easily be measured in life using a, a caliper. And it's a really useful tool for screening the compounds uh, that you're working with for you know, PKPD relationships and safety, um, and also get some early efficacy data. Uh, if you're more interested in studying metastases, the cells can actually be injected via the tail vein, and this will allow you to focus more on metastases as a primary endpoint. 
The advantages of this model are that it is it is an easy, rapid, and inexpensive um, way to sort of run these early stage screens. Um, the information can that you can get from these models can directly uh, um, assess both tumor reduction because you can measure these tumors directly using a caliper, and you can assess tolerability and toxicity at a very early stage. The disadvantages of this model are that the animals are often immunocompromised where human cells are put into the, the mouse or rat. And also, the cells are grown out of the niche, so you don't have that contribution of the microenvironment. Furthermore, subcutaneous tumors are not always metastatic, or they take a long time to become metastatic. And so if metastases is something that you are interested in and you're injecting the cells into the tail vein, another caveat is that these cells that, you're, that you've injected can metastasize to unusual sites. So what you're seeing uh, at this stage, your efficacy signals may not hold up in more sort of translational models. In this case, we performed a study using a triple negative breast cancer cell line, MD468. Um, these cells are, are triple negative as well as P10 null and P53 mutant. And we use 5-FU as the standard of care chemotherapy in this, in this model here. So what we would like to see for an experimental compound is something that would either perform as well, if not better, than the standard of care therapy in this model and could work well in combination with the standard of care therapy or even um, synergistically. So that's something that we would look for um, if we were to run an efficacy model, an efficacy study in this model. So moving along to um, the next model we would like to discuss, which is an orthotopic non-syngenetic model. So what this means is that the host and the tumor cell are not of the same species. So for this, you actually do need to use an immunocompromised host rodent um, as well. So human cells are implanted directly into the tissue site. This is useful, though, for more comprehensive efficacy studies where you really do need to more clearly define that PK efficacy relationship. The advantages are the human cells are actually grown right in the niche, and this enables a sort of more comprehensive interaction uh, examination. The growth in the niche can be uh, monitored using compatible imaging instrumentation, and I'll talk about that coming up here in the next slide. But the disadvantages of this model are the same sort of, um, as I mentioned on the previous slide, that immunocompromised animals are often required. And I wanted to use this here as an example, because often you can't measure these tumors uh, externally in life. So a lot of times with the mammary orthotopic models, you're implanting the cells into the fat pad, which in a lot of cases um, almost mimics a xenograft, where it's essentially a subcutaneous injection. So you can measure, in some cases, the tumor growth using a caliper. But with some breast cancer lines, for example, that MGA MB231 cells, there are more invasive cell lines. So as you can see here, the digital caliper measurements are sort of you know, all over the place. And so it's not really a good, clear representation necessarily of what the tumors are doing in vivo. And, and you can see here the standard of care in this case is docetaxel. And this is because we know that the uh, 231 cells are uh, not responsive to 5-FU. So what we're doing here is we are actually able to do is um, pair this study with an IVIS imaging capability because we know that the 231 cells are, are commercially available stably expressing luciferase, so the bioluminescence of the cells can be detected um, using IVIS uh, instrumentation. And unlike the previous slide where the tumor measurements were sort of up and down, you could see if you're looking at the total radiance um, of the tumors per animal, you can see a sort of more linear exponential tumor progression in the untreated condition. And then here is the, the, docetaxel, the docetaxel treated group, and you can sort of see a clear separation uh, of the curves. And here are some examples of uh, the IVIS images where you can sort of qu qualitatively see the reduction in tumor growth as well. So this is something where you really have to decide between you know, using a cell line that you can monitor in life um, if it can't be externally measured using a caliper or something like an unaltered patient-derived cell line, which may be more clinically relevant but would be a little bit more difficult to monitor in life. And if imaging uh, metastases is important, so the primary tumor can be shielded in the, in the IVIS imaging system, and you can actually detect sites of metastases. And this is the same cell line, the same study as in the previous slide, uh, where you can see really nice metastases in the lymph nodes and, and in the bone. And this was done at five weeks post-inoculation. 
So now, so the first two examples that um, I gave to you were human cells in rodent models. Um, and these are applicable where your compound is a pancytotoxic, something that's designed to induce a clonogenic uh, cell death, or um, a, where the target is human cells. So um, if, you, if you are targeting a different sort of mechanism, perhaps the tumor microenvironment and the niche, then you're really going to need an intact immune system to do that. So a syngenetic model is where the tumor cell and the, and the host species are the same, so that the animals can be immunocompetent. And this provides a really, really great advantage, and it's very highly translational. The disadvantage of this model is that, that it's not human. So we know that a lot of signaling pathways that are mutated in human cancers are either not present in mice or are not, uh, the, the cancers are not derived from similar mutations as they are in the mouse cancer lines or, or rats. Furthermore, there's not a lot of variety in these models, and the cell lines that are available are not really well characterized as far as mutation status. So these provide a, a bit of a, these disadvantages provide a little bit of more of a limitation. But as an example here, we did run a syngenetic 4T1 model. So 4T1 cells are um, derived from a spontaneous breast cancer in bald sea mice. Um, and this cell line actually does produce tumors that represent human disease uh, quite well. And in this case, we use a combination of chemotherapy and some fractions of radiation that are, are mimicking what uh, a patient might receive undergoing treatment for breast cancer. And this model is quite rapid. As you notice here, um, the data here are only 12 days after inoculation of cells into the fat pad. Syngenetic models in general grow very rapidly. Uh, this study, we would probably see a two to three week time span. So it is very rapid and responds very well to treatment. Also, the model is highly metastatic. And this is an example of um, some lung metastases that we observe. And you can see that they're histologically comparable to the primary tumor. This model can also be paired with IVIS imaging because these cells do stably express loose deferates as well. Um, and you can see here the cells are implanted. Uh, they could be detected you know, almost immediately after implantation and a few days later. Uh, it's even easier to detect them and the animals can actually be randomized based on total radiance um, or, a, or a caliper measurement. Uh, in the case of the breast cancer orthotopic studies. And here you can see, uh, looking at the radiance values, you can see that the, a bit of tumor regression here is a result of treatment with 5-SU. So this is a really great model to study as a rapid model, and it's, the immune system is, is intact. And you can also, in this model, study um, metastases if you'd like as a, as a primary endpoint. Or if you want to focus on the treatment of a secondary disease of metastasis, that's a possibility as well. And what you can do is actually surgically remove the primary tumor after a week or so of, uh, after inoculation. And you can see here, these are specifically um, metastatic sites. And this does not require shielding of the primary tumor. Um, so the sensitivity um, of picking up these metastases is a little bit easier with the instrumentation. And each of these types of metastases can be quantitated and tracked throughout the study. So in addition to imaging and using the IVIS and bioluminescence, there are additional ex vivo methods to not only image tumors, but to obtain additional uh, quantitative data. Biomodels has recently developed a collaboration with Numira to allow our clients to have easier and seamless access to these endpoints. So at this point, um, I will turn it over uh, to Dave Weinstein to discuss this in a little bit more detail. Great. Thank you very much, Maria. Good morning, everyone. So I'm excited to tell you about the vascular analysis tools and metrics that we've developed here at Numira. But first, I'm just going to take a minute to introduce Numira in order to provide some context for this work. So Numira is a specialty CRO. We focus on developing new technologies and delivering first-rate service in order to accelerate our customers' drug development programs. Specifically, we focus on high-resolution 3D imaging and analysis. We also offer specialized histology services. And our newest offering is a 3D cell screening oncology service. Today, I'm going to talk about our 3D imaging and analysis. This is one of the main ways we've partnered with Biomodels, as Maria said. They provide fantastic in vivo services for a number of key therapeutic areas. And at Numira, we've developed novel complementary imaging and analysis technologies so that together we can provide turnkey solutions to our customers. So let's talk about 3D imaging and analysis. So 
So when most people think about 3D imaging, they're thinking about micro CT, and in fact, that's what we do here at Numera. So over on the left-hand side is sort of a typical micro CT image that, that people associate with CT. So here you're looking at a RA rat paw, rheumatoid arthritis rat paw, and what you can see is what you see is this typical pitting and bone spurs um, that are indicative of rheumatoid arthritis. Those are important endpoints to be able to image. What we've done here at Numira is we've taken micro CT and we've applied it to imaging other sorts of tissues beyond bone. So what you're seeing here in this panel to the right is some of the vascular imaging that we're able to do with our Alta Blue uh, perfusion agent. So in this case, we're looking at all of the vasculature of the brain, so very, very high resolution. And off to the right, we're also able to image soft tissue structures. So here we're looking at fibrosis within the lungs in order to quantify degree of disease. Now, as I advance to this next slide, what you'll see is the real magic that we're able to do here at Numira is layering on software tools in order to provide meaningful metrics on this data. So as we all know, scientists don't just want to see the raw imaging data. They want to be able to quantify uh, and calculate statistics over this data, and that's what we're able to provide. So again, moving left to right, on that RA rat paw, we're able to quantify surface roughness. So just how rough is that surface everywhere uh, over, the, over that joint. In the middle, we're looking at a metric called vessel radius. So on that same vascular network, now we're calculating a specific metric of how large is the vessel everywhere throughout that vascular network. As you'll see in a minute, there are other meaningful metrics that we can calculate over vasculature as well, and those come, those come into play as we're doing oncology studies like this one we're looking at today. Off to the right, we're showing hyperattenuating regions within that fibrotic tissue, and here we can, we can calculate what percent of the lung is fibrotic. In order to deliver those results to our customers, and in order to allow scientists the flexibility to be able to calculate additional metrics on demand, we built out a system that we call AltaNexus. AltaNexus is a cloud-based platform that we've developed in collaboration with Microsoft, and it's a, it's a high-performance system that, is, uh, that runs up in their Azure cloud. So Microsoft has a cloud has a huge amount of compute capability, and within the Azure system, we, stall, we store all of, our, all of our project data. One of the really nice things uh, about this platform is it allows for very secure sharing and collaboration on these data sets. So for some of the metrics that I'll be showing you in a second, the way that we collaborate um, with BioModels and with our customers is by uploading the data into Alta Portal and then allowing our customers to, to view the data within the cloud, calculate analytics on that data. Here's just a quick screenshot uh, to show you what, I'm, what I mean by that. So here's a, a project page, in it we've stored a bunch of tumor imaging data, and as you can see mapped onto those tumors, we're calculating a number of metrics. I encourage you to go to altanexus.com and take a spin through some of this data. There's some uh, nice demos and example data sets for you to play with up there. So here are zoomed in views of some of those images from AltaNexus, and this is a, a quick list of some of the metrics that we can provide on these ex vivo uh, samples. So at the time of sacrifice, we have our partner, in this case BioModels, perfuse the, the specimens with this reagent, that we've, uh, novel reagent that we've developed. It's a vascular casting agent it's called AltaBlue Prime. And what AltaBlue Prime does is it's radio opaque. So with micro CT, we can do very high resolution imaging of all of the vasculature for each tumor. And then once we've done that high resolution imaging, there are a number of metrics that we can calculate over it. So you're seeing those listed over here to the left, in addition to, to tumor volume and surface area, as well as the vessel volume and surface area. These are the metrics that we can calculate on the, on the tumor vasculature. We can look at the vessel radius, which is what I'm showing over here to the right. We can also cal calculate some of these more interesting metrics, such as tortuosity, how, how twisty and turny are the vessels, branching factors, um, vascular distribution, distribution depth, how far is it from the outside of the tumor. And that's the image that you're seeing down here at the left. So 
The vessels that are more peripheral are shown in blue. Those that penetrate into the core are shown in those brighter uh, orange and red colors. So in addition to calculating those metrics, we can then map them back onto the geometry of the tumor, which is what you're seeing in the picture here. And we can also calculate histograms um, to talk about the statistical distribution of those values. So down here is an example of one of those histograms where for uh, a variety of vessel radius values going from uh, zero microns out to 200 microns, we have binned the x-axis and we're showing what portion of the vessels fall into each of those bins. So here we can see that the most typical vessel radius that we're seeing in this particular model um, is right around 35 microns. Similarly, we can read this histogram over here for the depth of the vessels. And what we see is that most of the vasculature is peripheral, with some of it penetrating deeper. And then one of the really fun things that you can do is you can combine different metrics. Again, the metrics are mapped back onto the geometry of the tumor. So here we've created uh, a joint histogram or a, a 2D scatter plot where we're showing that radius histogram mapped in the same space as the distance histogram. Distance histogram is on the y-axis. The radius histogram is on the x-axis. And we get out this sort of signature image, if you will. And by looking at that, at that particular image, what we see is that larger vessels are more peripheral in this case. So if your candidate compound is expected to target large, deep vessels, then these scatter plot signatures can be an intuitive way to assess that therapeutic effect. So in delivering those results, in addition to, to having the, the pseudo-colored images that I just saw, of course, there are tables of values. So here, these, these happen to be PC3 tumors. Um, so these are a different tumor type than the ones that, that Maria was just showing. These tend to be highly vascularized. And so what we're looking at here within this table are the tumor volume, tumor surf surface area, all these different metrics calculated over these three PC3 tumors. And on this next slide, you'll see uh, a subset of those metrics that we've calculated for these specific 4T1 tumors that, that BioModel sent to us that we imaged. And as you'll see, compared to the PC3 tumors, these are about twice as large in volume, but they only have about 10% as much vasculature. And with that, I'm going to hand it back over to you, Maria. Great. Thank you, Dave. So um, now we're going to switch focus a little bit and talk about some in vitro models that we've developed. But first, I'd like to sort of uh, set the stage for this by um, talking about how tumors are heterogeneous uh, in nature. And the first examples that I've gone through today have been cases where cytotoxic DNA damaging agents, such as chemotherapy or, or even radiation therapy, um, are used. But we know that due to this heterogeneity, there are therapeutics that are specific for um, a particular mutation or particular for cells existing in a, a different cell state than potentially um, its neighbor within the tumor. So in these situations where a therapy um, is a bit more specific, a bit more targeted in nature, you really want to be able to potentially isolate individual cell populations and study them separately from the heterogeneous tumor. And one example of this is cancer stem cells. So we know that cancer stem cells are a self-renewing, standard treatment, resistant population of cells, and that they are likely responsible for, for relapse in patients. Uh, we know that they're upregulated as a result of immune cell cytokine-rich inflam in inflammatory responses that result from standard of care therapies, including these cytotoxics and radiation that uh, we've been using to this point um, in the webinar. And this is a potentially dangerous situation where a lot of these toxicities result in chronic inflammatory driven conditions and that these can propagate these tumor cell niches for years after therapy. So in order to study the contribution of cancer stem cells to the overall tumor, we enlisted the use of the MDA MB231 cells again for the following reasons. First, we know that uh, it has been elucidated that one of the major pathways implicated in maintaining this cancer stem cell niche is the IL-8 CXCR1 CXCR2 signaling pathway. And this regulates the niche in uh, several different ways, but one of the ways is through prote potentially proliferation of the, of the stem cells and also um, directing the migration of the cells. 
Secondly, we know that reparexin, which is a dual inhibitor of CXCR1, CXCR2, is in clinical trial right now in combination with docetaxel and in uh, another trial with paclitaxel um, in a, for a subset of breast cancer patients. And work done in uh, academic labs has elucidated that this beneficial effect of treating with reparexin in breast cancer tumors is best in ER negative tumors and, and potentially even HER2 negative tumors and tumors where P10 is wild type. And so MDA MB231 cells are a good match for this system because they are triple negative breast cancer cells, but unlike the 468 cells that we used in the first example, these are actually P10 wild type cells. And also, we have the added bonus of having the stable uh, luciferase expression, so we can monitor the tumor progression in life as well. So in this case, we orthotopically implanted the um, heterogeneous 231 cells into the mammary fat pad, and we subjected them to the, to the treatments that you see um, above. And here, you can see that the treatment with reparexin alone as a single agent uh, is not as efficacious as treating with docetaxel or the combination of docetaxel with reparixin, which actually resulted in almost complete tumor regression. And so we wanted to pursue this a bit further. So what we did was we actually enriched the cancer stem cells from the parent line uh, using positive selection with CD44 microbeads from Miltony. And what we were able to do is uh, actually inject a more purified population of cancer stem cells and then uh, I examine the um, responses to the, to the same treatments here. And what you see here is now the cancer stem cell derived xenografts are uh, a bit more responsive to the reparexin treatment, although the treatment with the combination therapy is still inhibiting the tumor growth to the, to the greatest degree. And you can see the IVIS image representations of these, of these treatments as well, and these can also be quantitated. So what seems to be the case is that there does seem to be a need for sort of bulk tumor reduction um, that the, the standard of care chemotherapeutics will provide to enable the uh, stem cell targeted therapies to be more efficacious. But if what you're interested in, in determining is whether that therapy is potentially affecting proliferation or it's if it's affecting um, migration, for example, or both, these stem cells can be, as I mentioned in the previous slide, enriched from a heterogeneous population. And here you can see the cells were um, enriched using CD44 positive selection, and they are uh, CD133 high and CD24 low, um, which are the sort of characteristics of uh, this, this cancer stem cell subtype. And what we saw right away was if we compared the heterogeneous parent line, the proliferation of the parent line compared to um, the cells that are enriched as cancer stem cells, we, we see um, right off the bat that they have increased proliferative potential. In addition, looking at cell migration using a transwall invasion assay, we can see that they're also much, much more highly invasive when they are studied as a, as a purified population. So if you want to look at the response of the cells to particular treatments, even further, and this is really just a snapshot of a period of 24 to 48 hours, but you can start to see initial effects or lack thereof um, of your therapeutic um, on the stem cell tumor spheres. So here we see in the mixed population in the parent line, treatment with docetaxel um, does cause an early reduction in cell proliferation where, and this is what we saw sort of in vivo, where the reparexin actually um, does not have a, uh, a very beneficial therapeutic effect. So the combination therapy um, in the end did outperform all of the other therapies, but if we go back a couple of slides, you can see that this actually does sort of mimic what we saw in vivo, which is that initially um, this response um, was actually not clear until later into the, into the study. When you're looking at the cancer stem cells alone, now you're starting to see that these targeted therapies to the, to the cancer stem cells directly are having a bit of a, benefic or a beneficial effect on reducing proliferation rates, although it is not very dramatic, it, it is um, apparent here. So looking at cell migration, while all the therapeutics were able to inhibit the uh, invasiveness of the cells, um, in the mixed population, the heter heterogeneous mm -hmm. cells, the docetaxel um, compounds were able to inhibit migration to the greatest extent, whereas in the cancer stem cell population, the treatments that were directed more toward targeting the stem cells had the most beneficial effect in inhibiting cell migration.
So now I'd just like to take a couple of minutes and sort of show other examples of other orthotopic models of human cancers that we've been working on in the past uh, couple of years here, just to show a few other examples of, of orthotopic models of other cancer types. So here we have a model of uh, colorectal cancer where cancer ce colorectal cancer cells are actually implanted directly into the cecum of animals. And in this case, we used uh, CPT11 or areno uh, as a positive control. And the cells were actually quite responsive to the therapy. And this is an example of the tumor inside the cecum. And here you can see a much reduced tumor uh, burden in the cecum of the treated animals. This cell line is also available with um, stably expressing luciferase. And while I don't have that data to show you today, um, it is possible to track the growth and progression of these tumors using um, IVIS imaging. This is a very highly, highly metastatic model. Um, and you can see a couple of examples here of liver metastases and lung metastases. And again, these are histologically compatible to the, to the parent tumor. In addition, we have an orthotopic model of lung cancer. And here, the cells are intratracheally administered into the, uh, into the mice. And these produce very robust lung tumors. And here are a couple of examples of uh, using a, a couple of different cell lines. And here are the animals treated, again, with the arinotecan as a positive control. And you can see uh, histologically that they're uh, an efficacy signal here. These cells are lung cancer cells are also available, um, compatible with IVIS imaging, the H460 cells. And you can see the treatment effects, the beneficial treatment effects dosing with arinotecan. Here, and this is at five weeks of dosing, you can see very clearly the difference um, between the, the groups here. So this is just an example where the groups treated with arinotecan, you can see the total radiance is much lower. But when we withdrew the treatment of arinotecan, um, you can see that the, the tumors do start to come back, and this can be quantitated. Moving on to a model of pancreatic cancer, um, VXTC3 cells, which also stably express luciferase, um, are injected directly into the pancreas. Um, this is a very, very rapid model as well, and we um, dosed with gemcitabine as a positive control. So we would have liked to have seen a, a bit more of an um, effect with the gemcitabine here, but there still are differences in uh, treatment groups, and those are illustrated here uh, using IVIS imaging as well. And finally, a model of head and neck cancer, where these are SVC25 cells injected directly into the tongue of animals, and these animals were treated with cisplatin. In a more clinically relevant setting, the cisplatin would be combined with radiation therapy. Um, and actually, we're working on that study currently here at Biomodels, where we have actually made in-house SCC25 cells that are stably expressing luciferase so that we can better monitor the tumor progression here. And we can look at the combination effects of dosing with radiation and chemotherapy um, in this model. So to summarize the first part of the, the talk here, um, it can be overwhelming with all of the choices uh, that you have to make in selecting the right model for your, for your needs. And um, fortunately for you, and very unlike my dog here, you don't have to choose just one. So translational models, they do range in complexity, but it's important to have multiple ways to evaluate the dose efficacy relationship. And we know that uh, it is important to have a clear idea of the endpoint that you're looking at for which that matches the stage of development that you're currently in. And the model choice does need to be compatible with, with the treatment, so really selecting the right tool for the right job. And now I just want to spend a couple of minutes talking about modeling uh, efficacy in the context of toxicity. So once an efficacy signal has been achieved, um, it is important to determine that the therapy will not increase any treatment regimen-related toxicities or vice versa. And as new, as new therapies evolve, new toxicity, toxicities evolve, but the good news is that many of these involve the same mechanisms. So we'll bring this back to focusing on breast cancer, again, in, because breast cancer patients will likely see radiation therapy as a part of their treatment plan. And this treatment often results in a regimen-related toxicity known as radiation dermatitis, and this may interfere uh, with novel therapies. So radiation dermatitis is injury to the skin resulting from exposure to radiation. And it's uh, generally associated with breast cancers, also uh, skin cancers, and head and neck cancers. And it occurs in about 85% of patients. Uh, the severity of radiation dermatitis does range from mild erythema to um, a moist desquamation ulceration in more severe cases. 
and it does have a large impact on the quality of life for patients and can be dose limiting. Patients either cannot receive the doses of radiation that they need uh, for, their, for their tumor, or patients actually will stop showing up for treatments if their toxicities uh, become um, too debilitating. So this table just sort of gives you an overview of the phenotypes associated with certain exposures to radiation, whereas at lower cumulative doses of radiation, you sort of just see that uh, erythema um, in the skin, and with higher cumulative doses of radiation, you start to see ulceration, fibrosis, and even telangiectasias. And these can persist from six months to even years after therapy is, is, is finished. So this is just a di diagrammatic representation of sort of the, the pathobiology of how radiation dermatitis evolves and also other epithelial-based toxicities where upon uh, exposure to insults such as radiation or chemotherapy, free radicals are released in the tissues, immune cells are recruited to the site of injury, and this sets off a cascade of signaling events that ultimately result in robust TGF-beta response. And the issue with having a robust TGF-beta response is now you have all of this, these signaling events happening um, in the injured tissue, and fibroblasts are recruited in to uh, effectively heal the wound. And what happens in these situations is due to the nature of the induction is this fibroblast, which will essentially uh, secrete collagen and cause a fibrotic matrix, this signaling event actually sustains. So it does not resolve, and the collagen can actually, deposition can actually form a physical barrier that will prevent therapeutics from being delivered to the site of the tumor. So we wanted to figure out a way to model the, the radiation dermatitis in the context of these breast tumor studies. So in bald sea mice, um, we exposed the skin to either acute, an acute dose of radiation or a series of fractions of radiation. And in the acute model, the skin was exposed to one dose of 30 gray of radiation, and dermatitis was evaluated every two days. And I will show you um, in the next slide the scoring scale we used to evaluate dermatitis severity. Uh, this study lasts for about 30 days, and in the fractionated study, animals are exposed to fractions of 6, 8, or 10 gray, depending on how severely you would like to induce the dermatitis um, for your model. But the the schedule is uh, day zero to two, and then again from five to seven, the animals receive these doses of radiation directly to the skin. So the dermatitis is evaluated again every two days, and this study lasts a little bit longer, and I will show you uh, on the next slide why, why that is the case. So the scoring scale that we use closely mimics the scale that I, the table that I showed you in the first slide, where Exposure to lower levels of radiation just results in a sort of mild erythema and mild desquamation of the skin, whereas the higher doses, cumulative doses of radiation, will result in sort of a moderate to severe moist desquamation um, and ulceration of the skin tissue. And this closely mimics scoring uh, scales that are used in the clinic. <clears throat> so in the acute model, we see a robust induction of dermatitis um, very early by day 10, and it peaks usually between a score of three and four, and then it will resolve, will resolve rather quickly after that. Whereas in the, in the fractionated model, the induction phase is a bit slower, and it takes a little bit longer to resolve, whereas in some of the higher cumulative doses of radiation, even extending this another 20 days, we don't see a full resolution. So if, if, the, if it's important to study perhaps uh, tissue fibrosis in combination with your therapy, um, a high dose of fractionated radiation would perhaps be the most appropriate because there are differences in uh, the kinetics of induction and resolution between the two models. Um, however, both models are very re, uh, reproducible and they can be catered in dose response or dose severity to test particular therapeutics in combination with cancer studies. So you can see histologically what's, what's happening with the skin, where at low cumulative doses of radiation, you do see a thickening um, of the epidermal layer, but at the higher doses of radiation, you see a, a, a much thicker epidermal layer. And here you also, this is a Mason's trichrome stain, so you can see the, the contribution of, of collagen here um, in, the, uh, in the skin histologically. Um, and if you look here in this H&E stain, I, I hope you can see it, um, but there are, you can actually see the immune cells that have infiltrated into the area. Um, in addition, you can see bacteria in the skin, and you can see potentially uh, ulcerations. 
So this is important to consider when, you know, de when designing your therapies because if your therapy, for example, worsens the toxicity associated with um, dermatitis or potentially the dermatitis may interfere with the efficacy of uh, your compound. So to summarize the second part of the, of the talk, toxicities can uh, perpetuate these inflammatory niches and they can interfere with the overall health of the patient. So you really do have to consider how your therapy will affect supportive care aspect of, uh, of treatment where uh, dealing with these regimen toxicities. And to determine whether your therapeutic will act as a positive or neg negative regulator of the pathways that we know are implicated in driving disease in these cases. As I mentioned, fibrotic tissue can form a barrier um, that the therapeutics will be um, unable to, to cross. And this exemplifies why the best approach to preclinical modeling is a multifaceted one where you can sort of pair a model to the stage of, of drug development and uh, from initial screening um, all the way to, to potentially the clinic. And with that, I would just like to acknowledge the, the folks who uh, helped with these with this program and our senior scientific staff and then the, the technical staff that uh, work specifically um, in the oncology program. And with that, um, we will answer uh, potentially a couple of questions if there are any. Thank you, Maria and Dave. It looks like we do have a couple of questions. Um, the first one is, with this in vivo modeling, do you have the capacity to mimic a gene knockdown overexpression within the virtual tumor to predict progression differences? So that's a great question. So it, it is possible uh, using um, viral vectors or, um, or transfection to either knock down particular genes or overexpress uh, genes in cell lines. And this can be done in um, mouse cell lines, so that could be paired with a syngenetic model, or it could be done in human cell lines. And that way you can really sort of uh, start to address mechanisms of tumor progression uh, genetically, um, in addition to uh, pharmacologically or using biologics. Thank you. Our next question is, which are the best targets for aiming cancer, cancer stem cells? So the cancer stem cell research, is, it's a fairly new field um, as far as targeting these cells, but in addition to the pathway that I outlined, the IL-8, CXCR1, CXCR2 pathway, um, there is work going on in other labs targeting some of the stem cell pathways that um, are important in uh, human development, so the notch pathway and the sonic hedgehog pathway, because it does seem like in the context of cancer stem cells that a lot of the signaling pathways that are that are used in uh, tumor progression uh, in the context of cancer stem cells are very similar to the cellular, uh, the cell signaling that occurs at, during development. So um, figuring out a way to target these pathways that we know are driving the proliferation, survival, and migration of, of regular stem cells will probably be applicable to cancer stem cells. Thank you. And another relating to cancer stem cells, um, since most cancers are diverse in origin, do cancer stem cells also come in variety? They do, um, and this, this work is um, actually building all the time. So um, a lot of the markers, the biomarkers that are used to identify certain cancer stem cells within tumors, um, there is a variety of different, uh, a different signature from tumor line to tumor line. There are some markers that are present in most all of the tumor cells, like CD133, um, CD44, but there are some unique markers in, in particular types of cancer, and these are becoming more clear. Um, what's interesting is that some of the markers um, used to identify some cancer stem cells and, and tumor subtypes um, are functional, where um, they actually can be targeted and are being targeted in, in therapies, and some of the markers are, are just that, are just markers that um, where the, the actual signaling function is, is unknown. So each tumor has its sort of own signature of cancer stem cell, cancer stem cell markers uh, that are used to identify these subsets within the tumors. But it does seem like even though they're identified in, a, in different ways, a lot of the pathways and the behaviors of the stem cells are similar among tumor types. So that uh, you know, enables the uh, use of uh, a treatment of one cancer stem cell potentially um, that may apply to, to, to multiple cancer types. Great. Thank you. And I think that that is it for questions today. If you have anything further, you can either email Maria or Dave directly. 
and we will be able to answer those. Also, if you ask during the presentation and we are unable to get to them, we will be following up with you within the next few days. Thank you very much.